Why were Japanese tanks so bad in World War II? Disclaimer, I was invited by the Tank Museum in Bovington in 2019 to Tankfest, since this video includes some footage taken at Tankfest. The answer might seem obvious at first. Yet Japan was among the leading countries in the 1930s when it came to tanks, to quote from Heigl's Taschenbuch der Tanks from 1935. The emerging Japanese industry also stands out clearly in the construction of its own armored vehicles. In case of both armored cars and tanks, the first step was a close study of the products obtained from England and France. When the first domestic designs were put into troop use, valuable experiences was gained during combat in and near Shanghai, and existing deficiencies were identified. Thus it can also be seen that the vehicles developed in the period since January 1932 had reached a high degree of combat value slash effectiveness. So the question is what happened? As so often there were multiple factors that need to be considered. The first one is about getting your tanks to the era of operations. As you might know, the Germans originally had weight restrictions for their tanks due to crossing bridges. Well, for the Japanese it was not just bridges. To support the army's forward operating strategy, tanks would have to be shipped from Japan to the continent. Size and weight then had to be considered in relation to a transport's loading and offloading capacity. Balancing all these requirements, the army opted for light, 10 tons or less, and medium tanks, 15 tons or less. One might question the decision, but it was appropriate for Japan's limited industrial base, the army's operational doctrine, and the likely future fiat of operations. As such, Japanese tanks were rather small by later standards, whereas in the early years, this was the case with most countries. After a few years of the war, while well, the situation was quite different. A Hargo was not so different from a Panzer I or II, but in comparison to a Sherman, it could not keep up at all. Another aspect was that there was a limited need to improve Japanese tanks particularly further, because the Imperial Japanese Army was preoccupied on their war in China. By using an inferior Asian standard as a baseline for designing weaponry for regional wars with backward nations, army leaders understood that they were falling behind Western military trends of modernization as well as innovations in command and control and tactical doctrine. It made little sense, however, to modernize ground forces to European standards when Japan would likely be fighting poorly armed Chinese warlord forces. Of course, this is not the whole picture, since the Imperial Japanese Army was also very focused on one future enemy, namely the Red Army. Unlike the Imperial Japanese Navy that was more focused on the US and Royal Navy, of course one might argue, wait, the Red Army had a lot of tanks. Wouldn't it make sense to heavily invest in tanks then? Yes, and at points there were plans for this. The Imperial Japanese Army had many hopes of quantitative as well as qualitative improvements to cope with strategic goals. For example, armored formations began to attract more serious attention after 1937, and a mechanized headquarters was finally set up in April 1941. There was talk of forming 10 fully equipped tank divisions on a crash basis. The Moloch of the Pacific War, however, and the many defeats after 1942 prevented the attainment of almost all such expansionary programs. Not one armored division had been activated by December 1941. To put this in context, in summer 1940 the Germans attacked France with 10 Panzer divisions. Although it should be added, those were combined arms formations with a lot of tanks and with modern artillery, whereas the Japanese army had serious issues with artillery. Furthermore, I don't know how the Japanese tank divisions were envisioned. This of course brings us to the next point, the limited Japanese industrial capacity and limited resource situation as well. As you might know, Japan had a very limited number of natural resources. Additionally, the industry was also on the weaker side. Yet, motorization and mechanization are rather expensive. Not only to build, but also to maintain. For instance, fuel, lubricants, spare parts, skilled personnel, and among other elements. Motorization was costly, dependent on foreign supply, and dubious value on the primitive roads of Northeast Asia. The Spanish Civil War 1936-1939 seemed to expose the tank's limited off-road mobility, and smaller tanks light enough to cross unbridged rivers on pontoons or ferries were deemed more appropriate for the North China and Manchurian terrain. Even for one base material, namely steel, there was only a limited amount available. 
And you know what leads another steel? Yes, super battleships like the Yamato. I mean, the army also needed plenty of steel for artillery and all other kinds of weaponry, yet in 1940 there was a change in allocation. Specifically, the Navy demanded a fundamental revision in its favor of the 1940 materials mobilization plan. In steel materials alone, the Navy requested an increased allocation of 150,000 tons in each of the two quarters remaining, more than doubling in its initial quota of 100,037 tons per quarter. An increase this large over 10% of Japan's entire production of steel for the period could not come entirely from the civilian sector. A portion it had to be diverted from the army's allocation, giving the Navy, for the first time since the China war began, a share bigger than its rivals. And apparently this change led to a reduction of tank production by one third. Okada, the army's chief mobilization planner, recalled the diversion of 20,000 tons of army steel to the Navy in the 1940 material plants. What had been the result? For the army, tank manufacturing capacity was reduced by a third and field guns by 20%. Similarly, there were also non-material issues as well, for instance, a lack of machinists, so people that operate machine tools and or setting them up properly. Similarly, properly trained welders were also an issue and in short supply, something discussed by Stephen and Justin in the Ultra Short Guide on Japanese Navy armor in World War II. Of course, even if the production side could be handled, motorization requires a lot of skilled mechanics, drivers and the whole logistical train that comes with it. So one does not just need to build tanks, one also needs to provide a whole infrastructure as well. This is less of a problem if a country has already a strong automotive industry and civilian consumption in that regard, like this was the case with the United States, but this was not the case with Japan. Of course, these limitations might have been to a certain degree overcome, but once the Japanese put a stronger focus on the Air Force as well, keeping up tank production and development was not really an option anymore. Furthermore, the decision in 1936 to expand the Army's air arm and Homeland Air Defense Network shifted resources, capital and technology to aeronautical projects. Japan's industrial base couldn't simultaneously mass produce aircraft vehicles and tanks. As late as 1939, factories were manufacturing an average of 28 tanks or models per month. As such, the initial high standard and quality of Japanese tanks by the mid to late 1930s can be seen as a symptom for the lack of a proper Japanese grand strategy and adapting to the limited capacities available. Of course, the initial investments might have been small enough to not limit other endeavors, but considering that the reallocation of steel led to a reduction of tank production and field guns by one third and one fifth, suggests that this was not the case. An investment into artillery might have been more meaningful for the Imperial Japanese Army, if I'm not mistaken. While well, I hope you learn more on the context of Japanese tanks, thank you to Justin for pointing me towards sources about steel allocation, thank you to the Tank Museum at Bovington for inviting me to Tankfest in 2019. If you like what you see, consider supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar. Big thank you to all of you who already do or did support me there. As always, source the list in the description. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you for watching and see you next time.